Hi guys, it's Miss Myers. I'm the middle school art teacher and today I'm going to be reading this book for you. It's called The People's Painter, How Ben Sean Fought for Justice with Art by Cynthia Levinson, pictures by Evan Turk. I really enjoyed this author's illustrations. Um, while you're watching as I am reading, I want you to look at his different illustrations and the fact that he is a multimedia artist. He uses an array of paint, oil pastel, um, looks like some ink, uh, as well as collage, another li linograph um, pieces that all sort of come together to make his really unique um, and memorable inspirations. I really enjoyed this book and I hope you guys do too. Okay. The People's Painter. Uh, right here, it talks about a Yiddish glossary and pronunciation guide. I'm going to do my best not to butcher these words throughout the story. Um, it basically incorporates Hebrew and Slavic words. Some that they give examples of pronunciation are Kedar, which means elementary school, Mame, which means mother, Tate, which means father, Zaide, grandfather, and the Shtetl, which is a small Jewish town in Eastern Europe. The first thing I can remember, Ben said, I drew. From the time he could grasp a pencil, Ben Sean yearned to draw everything he saw in his village in Lithuania. His mame, Jettle's hands molding sturdy plates from slippery clay. His tate Hessel carving stout chairs out of spruce trees. And his tate's tate, Zade, chiseling wooden skates so Ben could skim across the frozen Neris River. Lithuania is a country in Northeastern Europe. But paper was a luxury in the shtetl and there was none to spare. So with his finger, Ben traced the Hebrew letters that curled and curved through his book of Bible stories. Then he couldn't stop himself. He sketched in the margins. Some Bible stories though enraged Ben, especially when good people got hurt. That's not right. Ben also protested when his Kadar teacher wasn't fair. After a classmate pulled a prank, the teacher kept everyone indoors, demanding the culprit's name. I'm not gonna tell who did it, Ben declared, and I'm not gonna pay for something that I didn't do. Refusing to tattle, he walked out. Justice had mattered to Ben ever since he was little. He was only four when Tsar Nicholas II, soldiers hurled rocks through his window and dragged his father away. Just because Tate had been demanding fair pay for working people, he was banished to frigid, far off Siberia. So Lithuania was a country uh, for several years that basically the Russians allowed Jews to live at, um, but after four years, they began attacking them. Your history teachers can probably give a better explanation than I can. Ben didn't know how to, oh, so I'm sorry. Ben didn't know yet how to draw his outrage, but feeling his father's boldness inside himself, he marched up to the sentry and at the end of the street, he shouted, down with the czar. The soldier chased after him, but Ben escaped. What a brave little boy. Tate eventually escaped too. And in 1906, he made way from Siberia to America. He wrote to Gittle, come. Eight-year-old Ben, his brother Philip, his sister Hattie, and his mame picked their belong picked up ah, excuse me packed up their belongings. But Zade could not leave the shtetl, the only home he knew. 
As the stagecoach pulled away, Ben had to let go of his grandfather's hand. He wailed. Some visual clues. A flag, Lady Liberty. America bewildered the new immigrant, trains overhead and underground, a cramped two room apartment for the whole family, a chair that rocked and nearly dumped him over backwards, not at all like Tate's. Tomatoes, ugh. Anybody else hate tomatoes? I did not like them as a kid growing up. And in school, Ben stared at what seemed like thousands of letters in all different shapes and styles and sizes, all different from Hebrew, even worse. Bullies tormented him about his clothes and accent, and they called him names just because he was Jewish. Sometimes though, they'd pause if he chalked their portraits on the sidewalk. No one drew people better than Ben. Can you imagine how hard it is for a young person going to a new country, not knowing the language, and having to just figure it out as you go. Seeing his craving to draw, a teacher gave him watercolors. Another paid him to pin calligraphy, elegantly curving the letters, all in English. By the time he was 12, Ben was determined to become an artist. To do that, he'd need to finish high school, go to college, learn about colors, lines, and anatomy. But his father lost his job. And when Ben turned 14, his mother ordered him to leave school and go to work. He argued bitterly, send Philip instead. But his family needed whatever Ben could earn. So he apprenticed to a lithographer who hand lettered signs for billboards and chiseled them into stone storefronts. By day, Ben carefully copied those thousands of English letters. He spent months on the letter A, tracing and carving every curl and every curve. Then he moved on to the letter B. Gradually, he fell in love with these letters too. After five years, he mastered the craft and his signs began to appear around the city. Remember, he learned Hebrew first, so this is his second language. The other thing I just wanna quickly side note is, um, this is basically the same process as block printing. You use chisels, and instead of using like a flexible, flexible material like we use in class, they would use um, a much harder or like wood or stone. It's kind of a lost art. You guys wouldn't even understand how this was done, but what an amazing craft that was. Back at it. Meanwhile, at night, Ben went to art school hoping to perfect his portraits, but there was a problem. Ben's teachers taught landscapes, purple shadowed valleys, misty haystacks, fields of cows. Ben argued that shadows are not purple and he detested cows. I like stories and people, he explained. Stories about people fighting injustice, about workers like Tate, and loved ones like Zade, and immigrants like himself. His teachers, though, insisted that paintings weren't supposed to tell stories, that pictures should be beautiful, but not represent real life. Hmm. <laughs> Since he didn't want to portray pleasant pastures or cows, Ben wondered if he wasn't an artist after all. Maybe he should only make signs. Nearly 30 years old now, confused and discouraged, he quit school, he stopped painting, and he sailed to Europe and then on to Africa. In museums, he gazed at centuries of pictures. This may be art, but is it my own art? 
He pondered. During that time, protests over an unfair trial in America also caught Ben's eye. Two Italian American men, Niccolo Sacca and Bartolomeo Vanzetti, I'm not Italian, but I tried, were executed in 1927 for a murder they probably did not commit. The judge and jury believed that they must be guilty since they were poor immigrants and opposed democracy white patriarchy. Here was something to paint, Ben later exclaimed, infuriated at the injustice. If I am to be a painter, I must show the world how it looks through my eyes, not theirs. What shall I paint? Stories. He returned home and told their tale in 23 pictures, even though his teachers had insisted that he must not tell stories. All people flocked to see them, even if they weren't pretty. So this is his first gallery showing, I believe. And the first time he had a real voice with his art. Ben didn't stop there. He painted other stories about outsiders, working people, prisoners, and Jews who had been mistreated, just like Tate. His portraits were so powerful that in 1935, the United States government hired him. It was the Great Depression and jobs were scarce. So was food. President Franklin D. Roosevelt wanted Americans to see that poor people needed a helping hand from Washington. For this job, instead of painting on canvas, Ben borrowed a camera. With his friend, Bernarda Bryson, whom he later married, he crisscrossed the countryside taking photographs that revealed hard lives and troubled times. Young cotton pickers in Arkansas, impoverished, impoverished families in Mississippi, manual laborers in Louisiana, child coal miners in Pennsylvania. Many people didn't know how desperate things were until they saw Ben's stories in schools, libraries, and magazines. They urged politicians to pass laws to make sure workers got jobs. Oh, sorry, yeah, make sure workers got jobs, families were fed, and children could go to school. This is actually some of my favorite photography. My favorite photographer is Dorothea Lang. She took pictures in the Dust Bowl uh, that really showed uh, how impoverished every people were out there. The government hired Ben again in 1937 this time to paint a mural in a new village named Jersey Homesteads. President Roosevelt's New Deal program had built the town so garment workers, most of them Jewish, could move from city apartments to the airy countryside. What story would Ben tell? His own. In three scenes, he showed immigrants, including Mame, arriving poor and bewildered in America, working hard, demanding fair pay, and finally, settling happy in Jersey homesteads. To Ben, the, to ben, the village felt like a shtetl, his old home. He and Bernarda liked it so much, they moved there. Their children walked by the mural at school every day. How cool would it be to walk by your art every day? While some parts of the government displayed Ben's works, others didn't trust him. In the 1940s and the 1950s, congressmen accused him of being disloyal because he didn't paint Purple Mountain Majesties or America the Beautiful. Instead, he shed light on Americans who lived in the shadows. One wintry day, two men appeared at Ben's door and flashed their IDs. The Federal Bureau of Investigation. They questioned him relentlessly. Why do you support workers, immigrants, civil rights? Isn't America fine just the way that it is? Which of your friends are enemies of America? Ben politely served them tea and cake, but he refused to tattle. So the FBI threatened to deport him to Lithuania, just as the czar had done to exile Tate, Tate to Siberia, his father. 
but Ben was not disloyal. I am the most American of all American painters, he later said. Eventually the FBI backed down. Anyways, threats had never scared Ben. I hate injustice, he declared. For the next 16 years, Ben continued to portray stories of people clamoring for their rights, civil rights activists, workers demanding fair pay, political protesters, advocates for peace. Americans loved Ben's art so much, they called him the people's painter. Ben drew until the end of his life, handing down his stories of justice from generation to generation. When he was a Zade himself, a grandfather and an educator, Ben encouraged young artists to sketch anywhere, especially in the margins. That was the end of the story. If you guys were interested in this book, um, Here's a little author's note basically about Ben Sean's life and all the different kinds of art that he did and sort of the main uh, focuses of his career. The illustrator's note, this talks about what inspired the illustrator um, as they created all the pictures for this book. He's a very talented artist. This timeline here also gives a um, really good snapshot of all the different uh, major things that were going on throughout Ben's life, uh, some of the historical context basically to kind of put this book in perspective. And then of course at the end we have our sources, gotta love our, you know, appropriate sources, all that good stuff. I hope you guys enjoyed this book. I thought that many of the topics that were discussed in here are still very relevant today, even though this took place um, many, many years ago. I hope that you enjoyed the illustrations and I hope that you also enjoyed the message. I have to say, I respect people who stand up for what they believe in um, and aren't afraid to fight injustice in their own way. So anyways, thank you guys so much for listening. Have a wonderful day.